and everyone if you can please start shall we begin Uh, distinguished guests, speakers, human members, industry stakeholders, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Zinur, and it is my very great honor and pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the SAS, the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, and the Pakistan Microfinance Network to this webinar on the provision of microfinance to street vendors under SAS Ready Barn Initiatives. I'd like to begin by giving a brief introduction to the topic. The SAS Ready Barn Initiative is the outcome of a multi-partite collaboration between SAS, the Capital Development Authority or CDA, the Metropolitan Corporation, the ICT Administration, and the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, the environment to street vendors in order for them to conduct their businesses and operate under a proactive regulatory regime, buoyed by the vision of our Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Imran Khan. With the initiative having already launched in two sectors of the capital city of Islamabad, it is intended to grow and replicate into other urban centers of the country. The objective of this webinar is to raise awareness among the wider stakeholders of the microfinance ecosystem regarding the commercial prospects of financing street vendors, which form an essential part of the micro enterprise segment of the industry, and highlight the role of the government in viable product development. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming this special assistant to the Prime Minister. Pakistan on poverty alleviation and social safety, Dr. Sanya Nishter, to deliver the opening remarks and formally begin today's session. Dr. Nishter, the floor. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and good morning, uh, everyone. Well, first of all, I want to thank the Microfinance Network for organizing this conversation. Um, uh, and I'm very pleased and privileged to be part of this discourse this morning. Uh, I'm making this, these opening remarks on behalf of uh, all the partners of the SAS Ready Barn Initiative, uh, in particular the Capital Development Authority uh, and the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics. Uh, I can see Nadeem Saab on the screen, but I understand that uh, Chairman CDA may be joining shortly as well if he hasn't already. So let me just give you an, uh, a little bit of an overview of SAS and, and how this initiative fits within uh, the framework of SAS. Basically, SAS is a framework for poverty alleviation, but most importantly, social protection because poverty alleviation is more cross-cutting and there are so many other responsibilities of so many other agencies uh, cutting through it. So SAS is a social protection framework which rests on 10 foundations uh, and it has 19 large programs. These 19 programs focus 14 target groups and it has seven time bound outcome based goals. This entire theory is articulated in the SAS strategy which is um, publicly available online. One of the SAS uh, target groups, other ready bonds, uh, other street vendors. Uh, now, when I talked about the 19 programs of SAS, they fall in three categories. Some of them are very large programs with a budget of over a, over a billion dollars with a national footprint. Uh, other programs are in selected districts. And there are some programs which are currently in incubation. They're either in the, in, in the pilot phase or they're in the stage of conceptualization. Just to give you an example, 
The Commodity Subsidies Initiative of uh, SRS is currently in the incubation phase. It is not even in the pilot phase. There are other programs which are where, which have been where the pilot has been successfully evaluated. They're on the road to upscaling. As I said, the second category of projects are in selected districts, some in 23, some in 50, and, a whole, and, and some projects, and I may be repeating myself, have a national footprint. Now the Ready Barn project is at a, is at a small pilot scale uh, with some very encouraging results. The pilot was set up in, in a certain context. Uh, Nadeem al is uh, is much more well-versed and knowledgeable with the context. And our uh, technical lead, Zia Bande, will explain the context in greater detail. I don't want to take the thunder from his presentation. He's, he describes it much more eloquently. But just to give you a taste of the context, in Islamabad, uh, the, 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 you know, the context in the, the domain of Islamabad alone, we estimate that there are 20,000 ready bonds. Uh, and of those 20,000 ready bonds, only 250 are licensed. The remaining are totally unlicensed. They work in the informal economy. Uh, they turn over a business of around 29 billion annually. This is totally unregulated. They, they, they are out there on their own, out in the cold, in a very exploitative environment. Uh, and the government has never uh, had, a, had, a, had an initiative at this scale to, to harness them, to, to give them protection, uh, and to look at things from their perspective. So, so that is the context, and I'm just giving you a taste of Islamabad, and, and there is, of course, the much wider Pakistan, which, uh, which Nadeem and Zia will talk about. Now, our pilot was predicated on the understanding that, that there is a role to be played by four stakeholders here. Number one, the government. So there is the ministry and, uh, and, and a framework within which we have to do it. Then there has to be a local metropolitan or a, or, or a city government, however you want to define it, that embraces it, that uh, sets up a regu regulatory and institution framework. So CDA was very much on, on the forefront and great contribution and leadership by, by Chairman CDA. So that is one part, the government. The second part is the intellectual part. So we partnered with a, with a think tank, with PIDE, uh, which had the knowledge and the expertise and the tools and the, and the methods and the, and the intellectual thinking to inject into it and the expertise. The third partner is, of course, the communities itself, the, the, the community of Rady Bands and the context in which they operate. Uh, and so as Zia Bande will uh, explain, this project has not been whipped out in the air, you know, at government tables. There's been deep engagement with Ready Bonds, the community of Ready Bonds, the association of the shopkeepers. There's been hours and hours of discourse and deliberation which Zia has led. And he will explain that to you, that the third stakeholder. And the fourth stakeholder, is the stakeholder that we want to mobilize, which is the microfinance sector. Because we cannot give these people cards for free. We've done that for, a, for a, in the pilot setting, in a very small pilot setting. But in terms of the scale up, um, commercial finance has to be mobilized. Uh, we are not talking about CSR here. We want the microfinance community to look at it as a business proposition. Uh, we have had initial success in mobilizing two banks, and we want to see how, with your collaboration, we can scale it up. So, 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 so you are the fourth stakeholder. So, in terms of uh, what has happened so far, we have uh, done an initial strong an outline of what the governance would look like once we're out of the pilot stage. We've done an initial design. We have a good sense about the targeting and how it's going to play out going forward. Chairman CDA is leading up the, how the institutional arrangements are going to be organized. 
the regulatory framework is being put in place. Uh, our colleague Shafa can have colleagues from the MCI are playing a very proactive role in the, in, in the institutional framework. Uh, and then uh, coming to the pilot in terms of its design, what we did initially was when we, we picked up one sector, which was D G10, subsequently G11, uh, pilot mapped the existing ready bonds there. There was a preliminary survey, who sits where, what do they do? Uh, they engaged with the local community of shopkeepers. Um, and based on the survey and based on who was sitting there, um, currently, those ready bonds were given licenses and they were moved to a safer place so that they could not be held hostage to uh, the shopkeepers uh, whose territory, so to speak, they shared and who were very extractive towards them. So the pilot, based on the cards that were financed by the government, by the government itself, was, a, a, was fairly successful. We moved to another site, but when we moved to another site, we involved two banks and we asked them uh, to finance those cards rather than the government providing those cards for free. Initial results have been encouraging. There are, of course, problems. Uh, because the local shopkeepers, a percentage of the lo local shopkeepers who were extracting rents from these individuals, uh, now feel uh, are not very supportive of this, but they are a small minority. Uh, we also have to deal with how our own um, mechanism of inspections need, need to evolve and what safeguards we need to uh, put in place. And Chairman CDA and and MCI is leading that part of the work. But the question at hand is now how to mobilize the microfinance sector so that you can view ready bonds as your, as your clients and how you can mobilize your clout and your influence and your footprint to offer them loans. And that is the question on the table. Now, I may have not articulated as elegantly as my and my other technical uh, colleagues may, but this is just a little bit by way of opening remarks. We really want to thank the micro Pakistan Microfinance Network for arranging this gathering. Uh, and we genuinely believe, you know, our coalition, the SAS Ridiban coalition, uh, genuinely believes that the microfinance community can play a very major role in upscaling this initiative and that you will be very valuable partners uh, going forward. The we are looking forward to engaging with your community and we remain open to suggestions uh, and ideas from your side. So with this as framing remarks, I uh, hand you back the floor, uh, Mr. Moderator, to, to take this forward. And I want to thank you once again for, for the help that you are extending us. so much, Dr. Sanya, for sharing your vision, thoughts, and highlighting the essential role of the SAS program in the development of the underprivileged of this country. Uh, in order to give an overview of the initiative, I would now like to invite Mr. Zia Bande, the focal person of this program. Uh, Mr. Zia, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, and Dr. Sanya. First of all, to you, to all your guidance, and all the gentlemen, and ladies who are sitting here, and especially to Pakistan Microfinance Network, who basically bought our idea and arranged this gathering of all the August microfinance institutions and banks in the country. Can you see my uh, slides presentation? Yes, Is sir. it visible? Okay. Yes, Let us start with this. This will be a brief presentation, as Dr. Sanya has mentioned about this. Uh, this is a scope of microfinance and street economy. Uh, because we are the, yeah, I'm a focal person for ISAS Ban Initiative and a senior fellow at Pakistan Institute of Development Economics. So basically what we are looking at, we are looking at from the economic angle that how much role they play. And on that basis, we have basically developed this initiative, uh, conceptualized, and now we are engaged into implementation part also. 
if you look at this slide, this is Prime Minister Imran Khan, his visit of G11 Merkaz on 2nd May. Interestingly, on 16th uh, April, it was inaugurated. And after 15 days, the PM was there when after uh, about uh, three years, he went out to see around the city and he went straight to G11. And Chairman CDA was accompanying him on this trip. So this really gave us a boost. I mean, was a, this shows the commitment of the PM to this initiative and obviously his vision, which has driven us to basically scale this project, to expand this project. I make this presentation. There will be four brief sections. Why street economy? What is the rationale? Evolution of a street journey. We will give you a pictorial tour. The initiative, the structure and parameters on ground and scope of, for microfinance, Islamabad and beyond. Let's start by the rational. If you're looking at this uh, street economy, it's a reality to embrace. I mean to say they are there. How you define a street economy, a retail economy based on exchange of goods and services on streets and related public spaces through regular or irregular vendors. When you're using regular, it means those who are licensed, irregular who are unlicensed. I mean to say whether you like it or you don't like it, they are there to see. And it's not only in Pakistan, it's around the world. We will talk about the numbers also later on. Um, what are the realities? The commercial viability, footfall in public spaces. That's why they go and sit over there. Economic footprint. Dr. Sani already talked about it. Formal economic linkage. They have a linkage with the retail channel for formal economy. And they are like about 29 billion rupees, which you are talking about. Just imagine the multiplier effect it has in the formal economy also. And entrepreneurship for poor. I mean to say these are the people with the survey which we have done. So the numbers which we've got, over two-third people are under metric. And about over 90% people who are doing vending in Islamabad are basically migrants from, uh, I mean to say, from the backward areas of the country. Now, when we are talking of street vending, this I don't, just want to show you the pictures. The street vending is done where footfall is there. They're natural markets. And it's not only in Pakistan. Look at these pictures. These are from China, India, Brazil, Vietnam, Turkey. And you look on these different countries. I mean to say these are the countries or per capita income is much larger than Pakistan. But still, you find a lot of street vendors out there. This is a whole story, and we can put it at some other time to explain you what are the international trends and practices in street vending. Uh, now, we, this is an important slide which we want to bring you, that what are the Islamabad street economy dynamics. This is some of the research and data which we have done. Obviously, in Islamabad, we didn't do a whole city data, but we are into it, and uh, eventually we will be able to complete. But initial data was done in certain sectors, and there we find the data which we basically try to uh, estimate it. Now, if you look at the side of uh, up operating environment, they operate in fear of affection. They have a high cost of business and they are unable to graduate from poverty. And if you look at the left side, the gainers, who are the gainers in all this business where 99% are illegal vendors? The shopkeepers, municipality staff, police and mafia. And if you look at the right side, who are the losers? Like you can find the losers, but even you as a citizen is also a loser in it besides the street vendors. And if you look at the parameters of this economy, which Dr. Sanya was also talking about, 28.8 billion. I mean, to say it's about 29 billion of sales if we put it on 20,000 street vendors. And we just worked out that if we take out this bribe or rental, which is on average 300, 300 if you that in yellow, is 300 is a low side. People are even giving 1,200, 1,400 rupees per day also, the payment on those pavements where they are doing their business. So this is an enormous market, which is not studied, uh, which can have a very important role in poverty elevation, for which SRs become a very natural partner for us. What are the challenges which are impeding potential? If you look at this market, irregular status, which we have talked about, entrenched corruption. There's a million of rupees which are exchanging from these vendors. Then we have seen concentration of power. This is the area where uh, CD and municipality are working because there's a lot of concentration which creates incentive for municipality also for sustained corruption and economic exclusion. Because of all this, you've got all these dirty cars working out, unoptimal, a work environment for them. So they remain out of the economic framework. 
for the government or anybody else. Evolution of street journey, if I tell you, the street journey is not of few months as Dr. Sanya. It started much before that. And it started in 2019, in which I was an executive director in a think tank, and we started doing this Chabri Farosh assemblies in five cities. And uh, we've done these assemblies in the Sabzi Mandis, in the open areas, and gathered 250 or 200 street vendors. Then we went for a more focus group discussions also with select gathering. Uh, then we basically made a short film also on that. And at the end, in the picture in the mid, which you can see, this is Ms. Shaista Suhail, who is the secretary of SRs. She was there in this draft, which we have introduced, a street vendor law. That was the pinnacle of that. And after that, we have a very formal uh, engagement or informal engagement going on with SRs since then. But initially in 2020, if you know that we have got discovered, that's why that thing got into the back burner. But in November onwards, we started it again, our engagement with SRS. And when we started this engagement, it uh, culminated first in a multi-party MOU, which uh, being talked about initially also. This is, and as Dr. Sanya has also, there were various consultation and concept papers. And it was not only a top-down approach, uh, we basically engage even street vendors. Look at these street vendors. We made a presentation in Urdu for them so that we can explain them what exactly. And these street vendors are sitting, they are from G11 Merkers. We even arrange, I mean, to say all this cart design and all those sessions on that. We arrange training sessions on food safety, secure, on food safety also in collaboration with the University of Arid Agriculture. Then this was before Ramazan, uh, this Ramazan, about two days back, we basically launched it. And as Dr. Sani have talked to you about, 25 street cards which were given because there were our 80 people who were vending out there. So 25 were given these vending cards free of cost and it was inaugurated on 16 April. And after that, out of those 80, 27 more made their own cards and remaining 28 in G11, uh, which we are talking about, G11, they are in talks with these microfinance back to get the loans so that they can get their cards also. So 80 were there. And this is what we are talking about, the commitment of our Dr. Sanya into this side. And you can see a continuous commitment she is going when there was no one there. Uh, though this uh, program, she was going there and talking to street vendors. Then after that, when it was inaugurated, and she, as she talked about it, that this was banks which came, and I think so for the banks, we give credit to basically Chairman CD on that end, that he was the one who basically pulled these banks. We gave them a presentation after that, eventually two banks came into it on board, and which were U Microfinance Bank. And if you see on the right hand corner, this is a picture, which is the first card by the U Microfinance Bank, which was funded in G10 markers. In G10 markers, we have 130 people who are vending right now over there. Out of them, uh, these two banks have provided about 12 cards and about uh, over 50 to 60 people are under process. It means almost over 50% they have covered in this area and they are fast working in G10 markers and G11 markers to provide. Let's talk about the initiative structure and parameters. Uh, as Dr. Sanya told you, these are the five, I mean to say, MOU, which was signed. Our objective is to provide enabling environment to street vendors to do their business in a regulated and conducive manner. Uh, then we have PAST, which is a thought leader in partnership. Uh, we have PIED, uh, who is doing all this research and work background, the basically skeleton building. MCI is the implementation agency. CDA is a provision of other infrastructure and Nowadays, they are pushing a lot of things in the operation plans, which we have made. ICD administration provides us, as we are talking about, that we have to talk to many people, like uh, if you're talking about these uh, market association, things are not very smooth. Uh, we have to work through, but obviously, every market has its own dynamics. And in this manner, we have basically proceeded. Okay, intervention components. We have three components. We are streamlining vending which are regulatory operational aspects of this initiative. Then we have to provide improved cards, which is placement of modular and eco-friendly cards. You can see them, they have solar panels and they have fiber sheets. So it's a light and weight. 
Then we are looking at inducing uh, inclusion. This microfinance, we understand this is one of the major role which you guys are going to play. And I, we believe that with your help, we can scale it very fast. Uh, this is an activity plan which we do for your understanding. Uh, as we have mentioned, PI do the survey, initial survey. Uh, we have basically under this MOU, we have developed a vendor support group, which has a representation from all the MOU partners. And this is basically the decision-making mechanism which we follow in it. So we prepare this, then we put it to the VSG meeting and they approve it. Then we have consultation with street vendors and stakeholders like market association. Then we provide these lists to the microfinance banks to do their due diligence for credit evaluation. Finalization of vending plan with the mark spots. We make a vending plan of the area that microfinance bank in the meantime, they approve the card financing. Street vendors have to submit the vending forms so that they can initiate the process of licensing. And then marking of vending spot in the vending area, MCA and PI basically coordinate with them. Inspection and placement of new vending cards. They are inspected by MCI. And then we have a formal launch of new vending cards where all signatories participate. Scope for microfinance, Islamabad and beyond. If you look at Islamabad, if you look at this picture, you can see it. Uh, I mean to say we have sector areas, we are non-sector areas. On papers, Islamabad look, have a 50-50% rural and urban population. But if you, from the typical urban definition in concern, the rural area, Islamabad is also quite dense and have a bigger chunk of street vendors working there, like you look in Latra Road, in Barako, in Kanapul, and those areas, which we have not touched right now, but we are going to go into those areas also. In Islamabad, the biggest concentration of street vendors in the formal markets, markets is in G9 markets, where we have about 320 street vendors working out there. And then we have a place which is in Sabzi Mandi in I-11, which has the highest concentration of street vendors in Islamabad, which is in thousands. Now, if you look at the revenue-based potential, which we are looking at MCI, that if you try to nurture it at present, what amount they are getting about from 250 street vendors is only 6 million rupees a year. And if we are looking that, uh, we have talked to these street vendors, if you basically give them a security of tenure and you make them work over there, so they're even ready to pay 6,000 rupees. And if you look at the right bottom corner, if they have 20,000 people are paying 6,000 rupees a month, uh, this uh, municipality can easily generate 1.44 billion rupees, I mean, which is about uh, the total budget of the municipality straight from the street economy. Now, if you look at these, uh, these are some international numbers because it's very difficult to find exact numbers and exact surveys because there's a problem in almost every city to find out the exact numbers, but we have got certain studies. So we basically research on that. And these are the 10 cities which we basically selected. They're developing world also and developed world also. Even if you look at New York, so New York has about 5,953 street vendors, which are licensed and estimated people are 20,000. It means that the significant amount of people, which is 70% are doing illegal street vending. And you look at this uh, middle, I mean to say this is, licensed to estimated population. So you look at Islamabad, we are at the lowest, only 250 and we are estimating at 20,000. So you can well imagine that in Pakistan as compared to other countries, we have got a very low inclination on regularizing street vendors. It is, doesn't mean that you go for 100% regularization, but even at a 20, 30, 40% regularization, so they create a lot of optics, a lot of quality of life and a lot of livelihood opportunities for the street vendors. In Pakistan and the urban Pakistan, which is a population of over 80 million, we have just estimated if you put it one to 1.5 person. So we have got about estimated street vendors population in Pakistan, eight to 12 million people. And uh, basically this what is the cart is which we are working at. This cart is into six into three feet, which is a standard size of the municipality. And uh, we have just estimated in Islamabad, if we are doing 100,000 rupees for each card and 20,000 cards. So the card financing market in Islamabad is about 2 billion rupees. So this is all on my side and uh, I'll be ready at the end to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much for the patient listening and we look forward for the, your valuable feedback on this. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Zaya, for the insightful presentation and for sharing your findings. Uh, dear attendees, to hear more about the views and role of the Capital Development Authority, the CDA, on the intervention, please allow me to welcome the chairman of the CDA, Mr. Amir Ali Ahmed. Amir Saab, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm grateful to Pai and, and uh, Mr. Zia Bande for organizing this forum and, 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 and discussing this issue, which has been emphasized by Dr. Sanya Mishra herself, uh, by Mr. Bande. And we have with us Mr. Mujimunak as well. Dr. Mujimunak is also there. So, uh, this, this uh, uh, a lot has been said, uh, and I'm not be uh, going in for repetition, but I'd definitely like to point out the challenges that we faced. Uh, the biggest challenge there for CDA or for the microfinance banks is change management. The biggest challenge that we faced, and Mr. Mr. Bande and the Honorable Minister can bear me out, was to change the attitude of the organizations. There is no denying that there are serious issues there is an illegal market which operates where not only the regulators, but also the, the, the shop owners were involved in, 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 in illegal gratification, which was coming out of this unregulated market. So the first challenge for us was to bring this network into a regulatory framework. Uh, uh, Mr. Bande has pointed out the revenue potential. I agree there is tremendous revenue potential. But as a regulator, for me, the main uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the deliverable for me is not just the revenue that comes out of it, but it is ending the exploitation which is there and which was prevalent. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll request Mr. Bande again, you know, when, when we are discussing further, to point out and, and point out openly what sort of activity was taking place in these markets. G11 and G10, and the challenges that he is facing and we are facing even now when we are implementing this change. However, change, as I said, is always difficult, but change is inevitable. We have to change. And uh, introducing this, this uh, ready ban program, which uh, the Prime Minister had been pushing us. And then let me, let me share another experience. When, when I got instructions that this has to be implemented, my first reaction was that let's do it in two days and three days, and this can be done. We had sessions with uh, the Honorable Minister and with uh, Mr. Zia Bande, uh, but uh, credit goes to them for holding me back and giving me a proper uh, way forward and, and an implementation strategy. Had we implemented it without going into the details, without exploring the market dynamics, without exploring the issues being faced by people who are involved in this, it would have failed. Uh, when the Prime Minister uh, undertook that visit in uh, G11, uh, many people had their doubts that is it, is it actually uh, the market there or, or, or this is some sort of an orchestrated uh, activity. Uh, let me tell you, uh, I would encourage that the participants should go and inspect it themselves. Uh, the market is functioning. The market is functioning because there's a lot of groundwork that has gone down. There's a lot of homework that has been done by Pai, that has been done by Mr. Pandey, that has been done by the SAS program, which is the reason that this is a successful model. Uh, we have replicated it in G10. We are facing challenges. I will not say that it is very smooth. The implementation and execution is facing a lot of challenges, a lot of hindrances from the established markets, and not just the established market, but the established norms which were operative and which are being eliminated. We are heading for two other markets in the urban centers because, uh, uh, as I said, our objective is to bring these people out from an illegal network where they are operating, where there is exploitation, and bring them in a net where they are safe, where, they, where, where there is no exploitation. And end of the day, the benefit goes to the residents of the city. Uh, Islamabad is perhaps the most expensive city in the country. We often take pride as CDA that we, you know, last week at an auction where we generated 38 billion rupees in two days, fine, you know, good for us. But there is another implication for that, which means that the rentals are extremely high. With these high rentals, provision 
of any commodity at reasonable rates becomes a challenge. These hawkers, these, uh, uh, these street vendors are providing an alternate market for the residents of this town park. So we have to encourage them. Uh, coming to the uh, aspect of microfinance banks, the, 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 the first uh, typical government reaction is that you know we'll, we'll find it ourselves and place them there. Uh, our collective uh, viewpoint on this was that it will never succeed. If we just roll out these uh, uh, vending cards and hand them over to people, it will never succeed. It would have not succeeded. So we approached the microfinance banks, and I'm really glad that a few of them uh, joined us, uh, participated with us, and have funded these cards. I'm told that now nearly 50% uh, of the cards are being funded, and the remaining are being funded by the vendors themselves. So there's a lot of encouragement, there's a lot of scope. This is business activity for the microfinance banks. Why uh, we encourage the banks to participate? Because it really benefits the street vendors. If they get financing, and this is secure financing because we have worked out in rate whereby the license is the, pay is, is, the, is, is the security, which is available for the banks. And if somebody were not to pay back, the license would go to somebody else, along with the uh, cars. So there's a lot of potential. Uh, there's a lot of scope. Uh, the government's vision is that there should be a sort of a branchless uh, banking network. And I'm glad to see that uh, this, uh, like these microfinance banks are providing and moving funding on a tablet. This is really encouraging. And I'm really grateful that this sort of an activity has taken place and must carry on. CDA, SRs, PI have to work together and this is a model which should be replicated in Spain. It is a challenge as, as the ills that were pointed out, but actually we cannot deny that. We have to embrace them and come out of it and take this as a challenge. And now we have a model, I feel, which can be replicated in other parts of Pakistan and it should be replicated. Thank you. So much, Amisa, for your time, your invaluable input, and for highlighting the role of the CBA. Our next speaker is Dr. Nadeem Al Haq, the Vice Chancellor of the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics. Dr. Nadeem, the floor is yours. Thank you, Zinu. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister Saiba, uh, Chairman CDA, um, Zia Bande has given you a great presentation. Uh, Zia Bande is a policy entrepreneur. I admire him highly. He has taken the lead in this initiative and must be congratulated for doing a great job. I'll just give a few thoughts from my side because we've already heard a lot. It's very simple. When I was a child, street vendors were everywhere in Lahore and we were always buying from Churan to Kulfi to everything from street vendors. It was a great, uh, wonderful experience and I enjoyed it. Then came the cars. And then came our forbearance for cars, our love for cars. And then we built highways and we built flyovers, we built underpasses and all at the expense of the street vendors. We threw them out. Now that's my own experience, but let's get to economics. There is a very old famous woman who died, I think in 2009 or 10, Jane Jacobs, who is like a very admired um, urbanist. Uh, in the world. She fought off uh, New York from developing a big highway through New York, and she left a big legacy through about eight or 10 books, where she, where she said her central theme was the street economy is the heart of the economy. She wrote a book on economic development too, and she said the street economy is the heart of the economy. My supervisor, Robert Lucas, won the Nobel Prize for 96, and if you look at his lecture, he talks about her and he says, Jane Jacobs was absolutely right. We have to have the street economy. So I approach this subject from that point of view, that the street economy is the economy, the real economy. In 2006, Pied initiated the debate on the demographic dividend. My colleague, Dore Nayab, wrote this famous paper, which many governments have talked about the demographic dividend, although unfortunately we don't cite the person who wrote the paper, but Dore Nayab started the debate. The demographic dividend is all about youth. 
that we have a youthful population and we must find them opportunity. Unfortunately, we never did. Yet we have had the middle class grow. Dora Nayab then wrote a paper on the middle class and we pointed out at Pied that the middle class has grown. How did the middle class grow when we were throwing out the poor from the streets? Well, it is very clear. They migrated, they left the country. The poor seek opportunities everywhere. You freeze them from street vending, other opportunities, they go overseas. They went overseas and today they are sending us 30 billion in remittances. Opportunities is what people need. Yes, SAS program, Madam Minister, is a good program, but we also have to balance off social welfare with opportunity. We are doing a big conference on opportunities in November. We'll invite you all. This conference is going to be in Peshawar. We did a conference before the street vending, vending project, project was begun called Excluding the Poor. Because we believe, and we've written about it, that in Pakistan, we have a policy for excluding the poor. I'm not saying it's a well thought out, announced policy, but as Hayek said, it is the unintended consequence of the way we think, do things. We are excluding the poor in many ways and principal way that we have is street vending. Now street vending has been analyzed. I've got a number of papers here, a number of analyses from all over the world. Just recently, there was an article in, uh, um, in the Vice News, which is a big news item. I don't know if you can see it or not. It says hundreds of millionaires found in street vendors in India. So street vending is a big opportunity. There have been millionaires created from this and this opportunity must be available to Pakistanis. Now there are a number of uh, problems that we have here. Zia Bande has begun to analyze them, but we have to go much further. We have to take this project out of G11 and scale it up to the country. In order to do that, we have to think of three very important things and we at Pied are going to research these and try and develop the framework. Very complex questions. I don't have easy answers, but very complex questions. For example, where do you locate these uh, street vendors? Should they only be in markets or should they, they be all around the city? As I said, when I was growing up, they were all around the city. They were outside our schools. Our teacher used to beat us to if we bought something from the school vendors, uh, from the street vendors. Yeah, they used to beat us in those days. We used to take the beating and still buy from the street vendors. So location, where will they be located? Why not outside schools? Why not outside parks? Why not mobile vendors? We must also recognize there's a certain diversity among street vendors. We can't only think of them as static and in one place. So we need to understand the diversity too. Remember, the entrepreneur knows what he has to do. We have to recognize that the street vendor is an entrepreneur. Right now, we think of him as charity. No, he is not. He is an entrepreneur. So in order to honor his entrepreneurship, we have to give him the opportunity as well as the ability to choose his own business model. And his business model includes the location, includes mobility, includes many things. Somehow we have to cater for the heterogeneity and the huge diversity in the street vending market because they're all kinds of street vendors from fruit food trucks to trolleys to um, you know, static vendors to even people carrying their wares with them on, on their sleeves. Uh, the, the knife sharpener, for example, or the guy who comes and stitches your um, little um, whatever things. So that's also important. The other thing that we have to work out very clearly if you're going to scale it up is how do we allocate these vending sites? These vending sites are an opportunity. Who do we give them to? Do we give them to poor people or do we give them to rich people? Recall, Nawaz Sharif did the yellow cab scheme, except he didn't think through all these things. And what happened is that rich people got into the scheme, bought a yellow colored car and then you know, painted it whatever color they wanted to. Mercedes were brought in the scheme too because he hadn't done the background homework. So that's important to do. In terms of allocation, we have to think about how do we allocate the poor? Do we use the lottery system? How do we identify the poor? Do we use the SAS card, poverty card? Yes, of course. But we also have to re recognize we are providing them an opportunity. No two sites are the same. If the guy is standing in a very choice site, it could be very valuable. The term pagri has to be thought through. Um, pagri is the valuation of a site. And the valuation of a site really is very important, as you can see from the market. Every site has a different value. So we are conferring a certain 
um, benefit on the person that we are giving the, the, the site to. And we have to think that through as well. Then comes the issue of graduation. Because yes, these sites can become very, very valuable. And as people work them out, they become very valuable. And these guys will, um, what do you call it, um, then be able to um, uh, derive value from them. And we haven't thought about that very carefully. So given that value, uh, we have to um, really begin to see how we can, um, how we can, um, you know, allo um, allo uh, sorry, how we can graduate these people. For example, if somebody started making millions of dollars, do we want him to retain the site? But then do we have the tools to take the site away from that person? So these are all things that we, these are all part of the regulatory policy that has to be developed and that has to be thought through very carefully. And as the chairman CD has said, it has to be an evolving policy. It can't be a policy, static policy. So we have to keep monitoring it with data and we have to keep monitoring it, evaluating it and develop the things. So it's, it's, but it is a critically important thing to do because street vendors are entrepreneurs and that's what we need. Now coming to the finance and the microfinance network, I congratulate for holding this thing. Finance's job and microfinance's job equally, microfinance should finance entrepreneurship. Right now, I don't know how much entrepreneurship they're financing. They, we would love to do an evaluation for them. But if I remember right, Raghu Rajan wrote a number of papers in Zingali's too, that the job of finance is to reward ideas. It is not to spend money here and there or give loans. It is to reward ideas. And if we want to reward ideas, street vending is a very important idea. Now, when you reward an idea, you also have to ensure the safety or the risk management uh, issues relating to that idea. And this is where microfinance critically comes in. I, My personal feeling, and I don't have data to back it up, but my uh, um, hypothesis is that microfinance has been waiting for this initiative. Microfinance without street vending is kind of a lost initiative. We keep talking about giving the poor a loan without giving them the opportunity to do things. If they take a loan, where do they go? They can't buy a shop in Centaurus. They can't go and buy a shop in supermarket or even rent it. So we have to provide them the opportunity. So I would argue, uh, Zeno Saab, microfinance is incomplete without street vending. We are doing you a favor by offering you street vending. We urge you to take it up. It is up to you to figure out how, what the collateral is and how to um, you know, make the issues of uh, safe banking, but that's your job. But you have to reward ideas, you, work with, you have to work with ideas, and street vending is now a critical necessity. Madam Minister, I congratulate you for taking it up. CDA Chairman, I congratulate you for being such a strong um, um, you know, backer of this idea. I think without both of you, this effort was totally um, um, uh, incapable of moving forward. We tried this before with Shabazz Sharif in Punjab. It didn't work. We tried it before in the Planning Commission. It didn't work because we had no champions. Now we have you people, and I hope that you will make it succeed. Seeing what has happened so far, I congratulate all of you, and I look forward to seeing this thing succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nadeem, for your kind words. And the, and the microfinance sector welcomes this opportunity to contribute further to the development of the industry. I'd like to mention that we're holding all questions for our Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. You can share your questions and comments in the chat box feature below. The next item on our agenda today is to highlight the role of microfinance providers in this program. Having said that, we have presentations coming up by the teams at the U Microfinance Bank and the Upna Microfinance Bank. We'd like to begin with the role and findings of the U Microfinance Bank on the intervention first. Mr. Kabir, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Zinur. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you, Madam Minister, Chairman CDA, and uh, Dr. Nareebul Haq, and, and the great work done by Mr. Ziyabande. And in fact, listening to you all today, you know, really encourages us, in fact, opens up our mind to, to newer things. So I'll speak a bit about uh, what we do uh, about U Bank and particularly in microfinance because uh, Mr. Nadim just uh, said a few thought-provoking things and you know and when I say it opened my mind it actually did not explain how uh, we primarily fund 
the agri sector. We give loans uh, to farmers who own less than four acres of land. That's the primary market we serve. Islamabad, this has been the first of such initiatives and we've uh, financed eight cards so far and 19 are about 19 are in the pipeline. And before I go further, I would want to make a pledge here that we're going to partner with you, not only in Islamabad, but all over the country, and we will help uh, in financing these vendors and we'll help in the graduation process. And in the process, I'm sure we're going to be learning a lot. I've learned so much today, so, so did my team, I'm sure. And uh, we would like to engage uh, deeper uh, with uh, Pais, with Dr. Nadeem and team, and, and, and know more about such initiatives and would love to facilitate and partner. With this, I would hand over the floor to my colleague, Mariam Kulwais, who's going to take you to a small presentation. So before we, uh, you know, while you figure out uh, you know, the presentation while it is being presented, I would just like to start talking a bit about the bank in terms of numbers. So we are at this point in time a very significant player in the microfinance space. Um, we have a loan book of about 35 billion, we are sitting on a balance sheet going of about 80 billion. Uh, we are an A rated bank. Uh, in terms of our branch presence, we have the largest uh, footprint in the country. We have about 200 plus uh, branches. We have uh, 45,000 plus agent networks. We are also leveraging on um, our parent company, which is PTCL. So we also have the opportunity of leveraging on their physical presence. And the idea is to take the number of our physical presence from 200 to maybe you know uh, more than 1,000 in a couple of years' time. Um, the reason why I'm talking about our balance sheet footing and uh, the status of the loan book and the risk profile that we carry at this point in time is because we want to say that we believe that all of this puts us in a very unique position to create the kind of social impact that is very true to our vision, very close to our vision. And I think I mean, we would like uh, to sort of thank the SR Very Fun program for providing us with this opportunity to be able to create this uh, impact uh, because it is indeed very true to our heart. Um, I would not like to go into the details of the program and how uh, the whole loan process is being conducted because uh, has already uh, sort of, you know, explained that in a lot of details. If we can move forward, um, at this point in time, we have uh, led up to eight cards. They have been deployed, 19 are in process. We are also uh, actively working with uh, the street vendors. We are also actively working with some of the major vendors. The major vendors at this point in time are um, the Lahore Engineering, Hashmi Trader, the Bear Engineering, and Shahzad Engineering. The uh, facility, as far as uh, the loan facility is concerned, we are providing it for a year, for one and a half year, as well as for two years. The markup rate is 18 percent, and we've done this after a lot of due diligence. We've done this after a lot of um, uh, thought provoking sessions with the particular um, uh, parties that are involved to make sure that whatever it is that we do is affordable and economical for the person that we are trying to service at the end of the day. Uh, the loan process obviously has also been um, uh, elucidated upon by uh, Zyasa, but I would like to say that we have a very uh, robust um, uh, process with respect to uh, the underwriting of the loan. So from our side, it is a commercial venture for us, but, but what makes it very special for us is also the social impact angle to it. And we are very uh, excited and delighted and proud to be a part of such, uh, such an initiative. And we would, at this point in time, uh, it's, it's a small start for us, but the idea is to be a major player in this segment and uh, be able to sort of uh, play a role in actually changing and impacting the lives of these uh, uh, local vendors in Islamabad and take it beyond Islamabad also to the rest of the country. Thank you. Over to you, Zinu. Uh, over to you, Zeno. Apologies for the noise, it was a technical issue. Uh, thank you. Yes, sir, 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 sir. Uh, 
Yes, uh, let's move on to the next presentation on our list. Uh, the team from Abna Microfinance Bank, the floor is yours. Thank you. No, Mansa, if you can please end. Islam, uh, can you hear me properly now? I don't want to. Dizzy, we can hear you fine. I don't want to. Achha, okay. Islam, uh, everyone. Uh, Apna Bank has launched uh, a product regarding the SRS Freddy Bond, which is we named it as Apna SRS Freddy Bond. On 25th of May, we got intimation. We had the intimation from CDA and uh, SRS all together to join in a, in a meeting at CDA for which the product was being defined and we uh, told informed for the financing of these sort of cards, which was pre-inaugurated by Prime Minister himself in G11 uh, before Ramadan. So basically what we did was on 30th July 21 in G10, we, were, we, managed, we managed to accommodate the card holders with their licenses and around three licenses were being issued uh, till now. And uh, about a, uh, 15 card holders have uh, managed to submit their license fees and along the uh, license fee for the uh, which uh, the licenses are from DMA basically and the 10% equity of our bank. And altogether 20,000 stalls, which is the uh, data of SRS, which is the data of FIDE, which we were told that uh, they will be placed within CDA. Uh, it'll, be, uh, it'll be done all over the state afterwards. Okay, the specification of the cards, specification, the cards were as per the format, as per the specified format of SRS, which is approved. Uh, we have made, we have engaged the manufacturer. We have engaged a couple of manufacturers, in fact, because basically if we get to order them 15 cards in about a couple of days, in about three days, so they only one manufacturer is unable to unable to deliver that. So after the discussions, after the meetings with SRS and Zia Bandesa, we have managed to engage a couple of, so that if uh, the order comes, if the, if the next markers is happening in next month, suppose, and we are able, uh, so at the moment we are prepared to deliver about 50 cards in about 15, 20 days for engaging uh, like about three manufacturers, right? And uh, the product process, the product processes on uh, premises services, uh, with the help of CDA MCI, we were able to uh, overcome our problems. Basically, but the uh, the card holders were very, very uh, in the first place. They were they were tight. They were they were unable to give us the information. They were not willing to open the accounts in the first place. Then the TMA got involved and uh, overall took hold of the situation and. Uh, uh, given that we gave them a confident confidence that uh, banks banks are there for you for you for your service basically and the placement of cards then after done engagement of the manufacturer which i told you before resolving queries of the card holder yes the manufacturer the first cards the three cards were placed by us and there were certain queries by the card holders and it was uh, as resolved the manufacturer got engaged at that certain time and he came and resolved the query Regarding the, 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 for example, solar panels and batteries and a couple of more, a bit of minor stuff. Okay, product pricing. Product pricing, we have got the rates, the average on average 100,000 to 1 to 100, uh, 1 uh, uh, lakh 20,000 rupees. But that is the financing, that is the total cost which we are bearing for the, for the cart. And uh, equal monthly installment will be for our plan is for 24 months. Which is uh, uh, basically convenient for the for the card holders as per our feedback, as per our research as well. Government agencies, the SAS and MCI allotment placement. Government agencies are involved, as said before. CDA, MCI, DMA, they are helping us to provide. They are helping the card holders basically to uh, get hold of their uh, places, where to get the, the places a lot. Uh, places are being allotted to them. Basically, they were based, uh, before that they were paying rent. They were paying loopy rents to the shopkeepers, and they were uh, for the different enforcement agencies were taking uh, were taking a bit of 
charges from them as well to just to be aware, just to trade their goods. But now they are getting their licenses, they are legalized, and uh, they are they are very happy for that. I've just taken the feedback myself as well, and they they are still they are in a psychological prison basically. They are what they were saying was uh, that uh, are we are we still going to pay the rent to the shopkeeper? But then we again involved DMA, and then DMA took them everywhere within the markets and told them that no, this is this is the place where you're standing. That is yours. We are paying the rent for that to the authority, to CDA, to DMA, right? Twenty-four thousand, which is twenty-four thousand per annum, two thousand a month. So basically, the and the cart is your property now. So basically, you are paying for that, you're financing whatever. But he's the Okay, then license security. Security is being provided by the authorities as well. And the uh, government agency that help the, uh, uh, play the role of being a bridge between the banks and the card holders. Challenges, challenges for the card holders were like, uh, it was a, it's a new project. They were confused in the first place. And uh, continuity and government environment, like, uh, they were, they were like, the, the, the project is being run by the current government. If the other government is going to come, so what is going to happen with the, uh, this project? So basically, we just uh, tried to counsel them that that how uh, the 112 was uh, initiated by the different government and the other government carried forward and took up the charge and making it better and better in like uh, within uh, the passage of time, right? So basically, the projects are for the people, not like uh, for the new governments, and it's not for the for order of like it's for the people basically, right? Okay. Number of vendors and traders, there are twenty thousand vendors uh, the, for the data which is being pertained by uh, SOS and uh, Marcus. Well, ongoing project is for the one thirty card holders and NG ten, which is in, uh, the trades are housing. There are like plenty of foods, uh, chaat masala, soda, and cosmetic different sort of decoration pieces, much as everything is there. So there's multiple uh, trades going on. And then, uh, Alhamdulillah, they are making they are making about the certain people are making 200,000 a month as well. So they are they are good people, they are good traders as well, small uh, entrepreneurs. But the thing is, they were they are legalized for the first time in their life. We have we have just like the organization, the authorities have made them wear the uniform for the first time. So that's an appreciation for the for our government, for the authorities as well, right? And uh, future expansion, future expansion is the, is a, the demo project is a basically is, is an example for the other provinces. Basically, uh, every province has for the SOS, every province has been intimated regarding this project. And once it's done all over in CDA, It'll be uh, the province is going to copy this all over the state, inshallah. Hopefully, I think. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Right. Thank you, TBU Bank and APNA Bank, for your overview and the support to this intervention. With these presentations, I'd like to inform the attendees that we have we are now in the Q and A session of our session. Uh, kindly use the raise hand feature of on Zoom to be heard, or alternatively, you can also type in your questions and comments in the chat box. Uh, we have one question by, actually several questions by Dr. Naveen Sahib, uh, which the, Mr. Kabir at UBank would like to address. Uh, sir, basically, Dr. Nadeem is asking, how can the microfinance bank simplify the loan process? There should be sh uh, short maturity, LOE, DOC, good surveillance, and with platform like EasyPesa, can we develop a mini market for commercial paper with these vendors through micro network, Pakistan microfinance network, I believe. This will have to be back with great histories. So if you could, uh, uh, would you like to take this question? Sure, please. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dino. Thank you, Dr. Nadeem, for asking these very pertinent questions. Uh, so as you know that we specialize in income proxies, we primarily lend to people who do not have any formal means of uh, actually documenting their income. So right now, what we're doing in the Ready Bank program, our total turnaround time is about three days, as opposed to seven to 10 days, which is for a usual micro loan in the rural sector. Uh, what we've done is we're doing it through tablets. We're taking the information digitally, and it is coming back. We're doing our credit approvals, and then we are lending them into the wallet eventually, what we will do because we have, we are a branches banking player as well and we want them to hold level two mobile wallets. Now the crown jewel would be 
a scorecard with an algorithm whereby we can actually give these loans without human intervention, but that's going to take time. So as we gather more data for these clients, the turnaround time from three days will come down to three hours. And on spot, if I may say, that's the commitment we're willing to make, and you're absolutely right, even three days is a long time. But there are other elements to the overall loan approval where other parties are involved as well. As my team told me, I think a holistic view needs to be taken, and we are willing to sit down with the other stakeholders to reduce this time further. This is the answer to your first question, if, if, if that satisfies you. For the second one, if I understand you correctly, you talk about a commercial paper. A commercial paper is usually a capital market transaction, as I understand it, to raise money. Uh, but in this context, I believe you're uh, you're suggesting that we actually lend to them, uh, you know, other than the ready bond program and provide cash. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, because this would need some elaboration. The second question for me to understand it better. Certainly, Ricky. What I'm saying is, that, um, this market is very different from the commercial bank market, and unfortunately, our commercial banks have not done well. They, they can't lend to the private sector. They can only lend to the government. In, in fact, we don't know how to lend in this country. It's, it's a bizarre thing we still have to learn. But in your case, you really have to think about your, this market. This market is very different from the commercial market, uh, from the bigger market. The bigger market, also we have a problem because we have lent to people with no skin in the game. So I would argue that please do not lend to people who don't have a skin, any skin in the game. I think they should raise money from their friends and family or sell their house or whatever. They should have some skin in the game, first of all. Secondly, there should be a credit history. You must have a credit history. You must already have a credit history through your business. So they should, you should only lend to people who develop a reputation for return. If they don't develop a reputation for return, they should be outlawed no matter how poor they are. It has to be good behavior, has to be rewarded. The third thing is, I think quite frankly, what are we financing? Are we financing setup costs or are we financing um, uh, working capital? I think quite frankly, setup costs show skin in the game. If you, fin if you finance the whole COCA, you know, um, they, they will have no skin in the game, right? And the second thing is if the working capital is quite important from their point of view. Yes, they're frugal people, they should evolve the working capital. The, the fourth thing that I think is also very important is how do you prevent people, people like me from hijacking the game? I mean, look, these are, this is not going to be small business. A well-placed coca could be a million dollar opportunity, right? It's like a mini dukan. So if you have a shop in a prime area, you know, I mean, for example, take a shop in F6 or near Centaurus or whatever, that would be huge value, right? That's like, I mean, I can't even afford it. It would be like five, six crores at least. Now this coca, when you set it up, okay, the valuation, I can derive a valuation from it. It may not be five, six crores, but it could each easily become a crore rupee worth of opportunity. If you look at per square foot valuation, the per square foot valuation could be high. Now there is a huge incentive for me to come in, if I have the money, to buy 20 cocas in the best spots and then uh, let my minions run them and make a lot of money. So you also have to figure out and microfinance could be easily raided. So yes, you are bankers, you know how to guard risk. So these are things that I think you should think about. And the fourth thing is that look, fifth thing, sorry, that it should be easy. These guys are not going to be, all of them are not going to be literate. All of them are not going to be great. But if, as you know from your own business, even an Ill illiterate person is a good risk, but with measures that Eunice, et cetera, talked about, so those are the things that I think you can be creative about and I'd like to hear about. Dr. Dean, thank you very much. I think I'll just uh, respond to all these uh, concerns, rather suggestions and points by, by sharing that we work with the economically enabled poor, as we call them. We do not fund startups, even in the rural sector, farmers. We primarily fund working capital where people have skin in the game to answer your question. The tech, and so this primarily exactly fits into our methodology of lending, as we do in the country currently, the microfinance sector. The part where we don't want to fund the, the, the big guy, uh, you know, so we are mandated by a regulation whereby the credit checks that we do by income proxies, I meant if somebody's making 50,000 rupees a month or 100,000, that's sort of our upper ceiling. And we look at this credit history. If there is no credit history, we don't lend. If the income through the proxy as well comes out to be, say, higher than 100,000 or 200,000, we don't lend. And if there is no skin in the game, we don't lend. So we are exactly 
doing what she just suggested in the other markets as well. So this is exactly the way we're going to go with the ready run program. Thank you. Uh, do we have more questions? Okay, Zainab. Please, Zainab, go ahead. Uh, everyone. So it's not a question. I, I was also sort of in, in response to what uh, Nadeem Saab was talking about. I mean, uh, skin in the game, different cheese on It can be, you know, whether they have a startup uh, sort of, uh, you know, they have a startup setup or whatever, but it could also be more conditional. So you could do a tranche kind of payment system where you make conditionalities within the loan design. And these would have to, of course, be optimized for the individual client. And you know, if you increase your focus on loan utilization, you can actually, uh, you know, uh, really help create that kind of enterprise that we're trying to create, so that there's more profit and there's more sort of business sustainability mm -hmm. for the client, for the you know mm -hmm. entrepreneur. So that's another thing we could look at. And I think conditionality is something that we, uh, you know, as a sector, or you know, generally we don't really put into a lot of financial outputs that we're doing, even with you know cash transfers and all. Um, you know, they really help change people's behavior and they really help uh, people use the money for what it is intended. So that's something that, you know, as a, not just as a sector, but as a country, we need to look at conditionalities to cash, cash transfers. We need to look at conditionalities to, you know, loans and, um, you know, that are more than just the financial terms. Um, Uskilava, so Kabir was talking about the algorithms and, you know, how that information is not there. So we could maybe leverage on existing information from other sources, you know, um, if there's a list of vendors that somebody has worked with or, you know, somebody's working with, if there's a central system where people can register onto, uh, you know, for smaller or semi sort of small setups, uh, those could then go into a pre-qualification, which could then reduce the, you know, cost of operations or the cost of, you know, um, analyzing the business and reduce KYC costs, you know, increase, uh, reduce the turnaround time, um, reduce the risk. So all of those things could also help when you're really designing the product. But Nadeem Saab, I feel that your points raised when you were speaking and, you know, the questions that you sort of put, put out there, uh, they're really important because the design of the loan uh, would be very integral to whether this will be able to succeed or achieve the results that we're talking about. So that's just my bit. To do. I'm sorry, I didn't have a question. I just uh, uh, thought I'd put in my bit to what Nadeem Saab was saying. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Zenu, can, uh, Zenu, can I interfere? Can of I speak on that? Please okay, go ahead. Okay, okay. okay uh, they were important inputs from, uh, obviously from Kabir Saab, from Dr. Saab, and Zenab also onto that. Uh, let me give you a piece of my mind on the things which we are talking about and how we basically look at the design of this intervention. For us, this is an intervention, which we are there and microfinance banks are an important part of it. And if you look at this particular intervention, so what is the first layer of doing a due diligence? We are doing the survey. Now, if you look at, as Noman also mentioned from Apna Bank, that there are people who are earning 200,000 rupees a month also. And there are people who are earning 50,000 rupees a month also. I mean, to say there's a vast range between these two. So what we are trying to work out that we, first of all, we are only selecting people who are doing actually vending on the area. I tell you, street vending is not an easy business. Every poor man cannot do street vending. If you are operating in Islamabad in a temperature from 48 degrees centigrade to minus two degrees centigrade, it's not an easy job. That's because you are a poor, we give you a cart. So it means that we are starting from these people. That is the first line which we are working out that, okay, this is the first line of selection. And then we engage these microfinance banks that you do your own due diligence. You have your own, I mean, do say standards and work out how to sift people through it so that you can select a good credit out of it. Poor is one thing we are assuming that the people are all people are poor. They could be some lower middle class or middle class sort of people who are doing a vending also out there. But obviously the big majority is from the low income segment who are working over there. So what is important for us is this, that you are doing your own diligence. This is a new product. We are ensuring when we are giving them their vending forms, I mean to say what the checks we are putting into it, we are taking an undertaking from these people when we are giving them a license that nobody is going to vend except you. We don't want to have a secondary trading out there. Yes, we cannot stop it, but legally we'll make it illegal and we will try to impose it. You cannot do a secondary trading. It means the person who we are taking their CNIC and we are taking their family registration certificates. 
it means that we have a list of people who can be actually on that pending card that could be a family member or that person so it's not like that that a person have a money so he can i mean to say get about 20 cards and he can then do for the secondary trading it will not be there no matter how lucrative a place is we have to ensure that that is a a valuable space as dr saab has also mentioned a valuable space it means that that space should only be given to a person who is actually working on it we are not going to ensure that in case of that violation that license should be cancelled and it should be given to somebody else i mean to say we can always put all these stipulations in the legal framework violations will be there but we are trying to work out that the impact the impact which we are talking it goes through to the lower income segment it goes through i mean to say that if we can achieve 80% or 85% of our proposed targets i mean so say that will be our success we are not assuming that it will be 100% there will be leakages there will be frauds uh, there will be manipulations there will be many things out going on there and for that purpose even are uh, we are working with with cd and municipality for the restructuring side also because we what we are which we have not talked about right now we were talking more about the microfinance but we are working on regulation developmental and enforcement these three segments we are separating it and that's the way we are going to work out with the street economy i mean to say there's a lot many things which are coming in the pipeline which we will share with you in due course of time but right now what we are trying to structure is this that we have to cover your risk when you are coming to the it means we are giving you a captive customer base which is well surveyed by pipe it means this is our responsibility which we are giving you then cda or mci is covering your back on the license side if somebody defaults we take away their license we confiscate their place i mean to say the money goes for that place the money goes for that place where they are making money so it means that what we want all these microfinance community to look into it that what sort of a money they can make with risk adjusted returns which i believe it offers you a good and it comes in line with your mandate also thank you uh, thank you so much jaya sahab uh, ladies and gentlemen in the interest of time we only have uh, we only have only we can only take two more questions so i see the deem sahab has raised his hand one hand the deem sahab Uh, okay, so let me quickly say, just very quickly. I think Zasa, you mentioned something about organizing street vendors. I'm very happy that you're organizing street vendors, but I think organizations in Pakistan also have a problem. They become vested interests rather than um, community service. So, you, taking off from Unis's model, I think the most important thing is to think about what is this central organization going to do? Is it just going to become another lobby, like Aptima or something, or is it going to be able to? um provide some common services i can think of for example this organization that you are forming is it going to keep a database on 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 the uh, vendors is it going to tell us how those vendors are doing is it going to offer common services like accounting like for example uh, business strategy development like marketing like whatever i think if you make an organization please ensure that it does not become like the lobbying group that we have in the big industry this organization should be a common service organization not a lobbying organization and i really like zanab's intervention on conditionality we really have to think about conditionality it's not a bad thing this conditionality for example them submitting reports if they have accounting services common accounting services they can submit reports this too can be in some sense managed through microfinance or through srs so we have to have a holistic integrated program otherwise in our country rent seeking is the order of the day we rent seek on plots we rent seek on industry we rent seek on everything i really fear this could become a rent seeking model too so we should be on our guard on that second is yes sir risk taking is an essential part of business these people should take the risks too we should not cover all the risks they have to take the risks otherwise they will not, not become entrepreneurs so we backstop them but we don't take away the risks the risk is theirs we only backstop them thank you Dr. Nadeem, uh, so we do we have any more questions? All right, I see none. Uh, so 
for the closing remarks now, I'd like to call upon our very own Mr. Mohsin Ahmed, CEO of the Pakistan Microfinance Network, to conclude today's session. Mohsin Saab, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Zinur. And thank you, everyone, especially uh, the panel, uh, um, Honorable Minister, uh, Dr. Nadeem ul -Haq, the Chairman, CDA, and uh, and the speakers and everyone else present uh, today. I think this is a very interesting discussion and I, uh, I'll go back uh, the week, a week from now uh, when uh, Mr. Bande met us. And uh, I can just tell you a few things that uh, over the last six months to a year, what we have seen in Islamabad is something really incredible. Uh, I must appreciate the chairman CDA, Mr. Amar Ali on that. Uh, what we are seeing is that way back when I was a child, I remember we had streams in Islamabad where we could uh, uh, look, see fishes. And now I can see that the streams are being cleaned. Similarly, we can see parks all across the highways and uh, along with that, the jogging areas. So when I used to drive from my office back uh, to my home, uh, which is uh, near, uh, near to which is Fazaya colony and close to Khanapul, I always used to think that who is going to uh, address this issue of the vendors. And I'm not just talking about the fact that the, 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 the street carts don't look beautiful they look in fact ugly but that's most of the time i also see them running because some cda truck is coming and they are whispering to each other that let's uh, let's run and uh, and i'm sure you know that uh, mr chairman has cd about this so so when mr bandy came i thought that look this is something really what i have i have always been thinking that this needs to be addressed so let's and we have the example of the flower markets in Islamabad in certain sectors of Islamabad. So how can we make this more beautiful? And so this was very close to my heart also. And uh, when uh, Zabande Saab said that we will engage uh, the, ch the chairman uh, Esas and we will have Pied involved in it and we will have the microfinance sector become uh, uh, understanding because some pilot has already been done and that uh, if the wider sector from, uh, from the microfinance sector Sector can join in so close to micro uh, PMN has a membership of close to 45 members and they in combination represent 99% uh, of the industry have a loan book of close to 370 billion rupees 8.2 million active borrowers I think this is an area we need to focus on and uh, in, co in collaboration with because we are a network we need to collaborate and create linkages between our members and this we, we could also show two of our member institutions who have done uh, a uh, reasonable number of uh, lending also so you can you can also uh, get more input from them on on their challenges and successes so this is something we will definitely uh, promote in collaboration with all the stakeholders my only uh, view would be that going beyond cda do we have this kind of interest uh, with other governments and especially the uh, the, the the city authorities so, 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 how do we uh, um, actually market? Maybe in a in a year from now, when this is a successful initiative, with other uh, uh, city authorities, I think that is something we need to also discuss going forward. Uh, as we move forward on this. So PMN is there G, to make sure that we are creating the linkages and also doing these uh, Zoom webinars or, or when as the situation improved in terms of uh, COVID crisis, we can also engage with each other. We, we are also going to do our annual conference in October. So we can have some of you present over there and share some of your experiences on this. So we, we will be providing our platform uh, to all of you so that we can take this forward. So thank you very much. Uh, as Mohsin rightly put, let us all go away from here with one key takeaway in mind that the best way to combat these challenges faced by the end of privilege is to work together. It is with these collaborations and synergies, such as in the case of this initiative, that we shall be able to reap more benefits from shared efforts to improve livelihoods and grow onwards towards sustainable development. We are grateful for this collaborative partnership established between the Poverty Alleviation and Social Safety Division, the Capital Development Authority, the Metropolitan Corporation of Islamabad, the ICT Administration, and the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics. With these words, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and pleasant duty for me to conclude this webinar. Thank you, esteemed guests, Dr. Sanya, Mr. Ramit, Chairman Sirie, Zia Saab, and Dr. Nadeem for your time, thoughts, efforts, and insights.
Thank you for being a part of this session. And until next time, goodbye and stay safe.